we we have uh, three short speakers or short presentations in our seminar today. First, um, Onikachi is the uni. Um, <laughs> after this, um, Collins Matisse and then Andreas Schwarz Meyer. The three of them are visiting us. You've seen them around, sure, over the past two weeks from the University of Cape Town. And um, yeah, I, I leave it here. I think you can also introduce if you want your your set for example. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Hi everyone. Thank you for taking out your time to come and listen to me speak on um on the topic detection attribution um and decadal prediction of climate change impacts on health climate. Um It's not moving. Okay. Okay. So at the end of my presentation, what I do intend to talk about today is just walk you through um, my career path, what I've done previously in my research, what I'm currently doing, and what I intend to do in the future. Um, so for, I think we can go right in where I speak about my previous research work. So I did a study on, um, I'm trying to take that off. Is it fine? I guess it's like this blue, okay. Okay. Because it's not showing on my screen. Sorry for that. Apologies. Yeah. So I did a study that was titled Predicted Changes in Habitant Suitability of Human Schistosomiasis Intermediate Host Snails in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. And Schistosomiasis is also known as Bilhaza and is a neglected tropical disease that is caused by parasitic worms. And those worms develop in snails that lives in water and enters into human beings through their skins and they end up getting infected. There are basically two major forms of schistosomiasis, the intestinal schistosomiasis and the and urogenital schistosomiasis. And the intermediate host nodes that are responsible for these schistosomiasis are Blinus globosus and Biophalaria fieferi. And we do know that climate change leads to change in environmental um, variables, environmental conditions, which could consider considerably um, alter the abundance and the distribution of the schistosomiasis intermediate host nodes. So for this particular study, we were interested in identifying the main environmental factors, variables that influence suitable habitats for the distribution of human schistosomiasis um, in KZ and KwaZulu-Natal province, and then to model um, the current as well as predict future suitable habitats for the distribution of human schistosomiasis. Um, under different climate conditions. So the study area was KZN and KZN is situated in the southeastern part of South, um, South Africa. It comprises of 10 districts and one uh, municipality, metropolitan municipality. And for this study, we went to the entire district and on this map to your left um, at the point where we saw occurrences of the intermediate host nodes. So the red triangles are B globosas and the circles in green are the fear fairies. And for the B globosas, we had 38 occurrence points and 17 occurrence points for B fear fairy. Now we made use of bioclimatic variables from the AFRICLIM assemble model with the representation concentration pathways for 4.5 and 
8.5 to be able to predict what the changes in the distribution of these intermediate host snails would look like. And we did this using the Maxent model. So the results I present here on the screen um, is basically the areas that we have found to be currently suitable at the time when this work was done, and then the projections of what the possible changes would look like under the RCP 4.5 and 8.5. So about 83% um, of KwaZulu-Natal province were currently not suitable for big globosis. Um, however, those that are currently, uh, however, 32.4% that are currently not suitable will end up being suitable in the future under the RCP 4.5 um, scenario. And for currently 16, about 17% of KwaZulu-Natal is suitable for the distribution of um, blindness globosis, but 4.5% of the areas that are currently suitable will end up becoming unsuitable under the 4.5 scenarios. And from the um, map being shown here, the areas that uh, happen to be suitable for, for big globuses happen to be in the north um, and then the north yeah, the northeastern regions and also the north southern regions. So, and these um, remained the case for all the scenarios. Under the B here, ferry, 88.2% um, of KwaZulu Natal will always remain unsuitable for the distribution of Shistos. Um, for the distribution of beef here ferry. So what we, and from the map, the area that is in green is showing that areas that we are currently suitable will eventually become unsuitable in the future for the distribution of this disease. So what we observed in this particular work we did is that for B globosus, there was expansions in the um, habitat suitability for the distribution of big globosus, while for beef here ferry, there was a shift and shrink in the habitant suitability. So now I just want to briefly speak on what I'm currently doing. And I'm currently working on the detection and attribution of climate change impact on health outcomes. And we can all agree that um, we are feeling the impact of um, climate change on our health as a result of the regular exposure to intensive heat waves, extreme weather condition. And this has led to an increase in the surges and emerg emergence of diseases. And what we intend to do in this study is to actually quantify by how much is climate change responsible for the changes we see in health outcomes. And these are the objectives of the study to detect and to attribute impact of health outcomes to human induced climate change, and then to make annual to decadal predictions of how climate change has impacts on our health. Um, I think I'm running out of time, but detection is basically the way we are working um, on it in our own uh, framework is the process of demonstrating that a significant change in disease incidence or transmission risk is consistent with demonstrated climate change in the space and time. And while attribution is the process of establishing the most likely causes of these detected changes with some level of con confidence, and that's what we intend to do. 
Um, there are different types of attribution, but for us of interest is impact attribution, which focuses on isolating and quantifying the causal role of human caused climate change on specific social or health outcomes of interest. And the data we intend to use to answer the research questions are health data and climate data. So the health data for us would mostly be either prevalence data or incidence data of a particular um, health disease of interest, um, of interest that we're interested in. And then climate data, we would make use of the observed data as well as the simulated data. And from the simulated data, we take into account the historical natural and the historical greenhouse um, um, gas emissions. And we move forward to coming up with the methodological framework. So the first thing for us is to um, establish that there is actually is to establish that climate is actually having an impact on health outcomes. And we do do this using statistical models, which could be longitudinal, longitudinal nonlinear, lagged, just to explain the relationship between the health outcomes and climate. And then we go further to fit that simulate um, fit the statistical model, making use of the observed climate data that would have been bias corrected and the simulated um, historical natural bias corrected data as well as um, statistical model fitted to bias corrected historical greenhouse gas um, emissions data and we eventually make predictions. We make predictions using both the um, scenarios as well as annual to decadal predictions. Um, so this is just an example of what the statistical model um, looks like, will look like while we apply it to different diseases and that's just the map. So the difference between the gray line and the blue line is actually what we refer to as attribution. And that is the impact that is attributed to anthropogenic climate change. We intend to apply this um, framework to different diseases that we're currently working on. At this moment, I don't have the results. That's why I didn't present results right here. But we're currently working on Lyme disease, schistosomiasis, and for decadal prediction, which is the reason why we're here, we're working on the malaria um, prediction. And what we intend to do is, in the future, we intend to account for complex interactions because currently, the statistical model we are fitting does not incorporate the disease vectors, does not incorporate interventions. So our plan is to incorporate these complex interactions in the detection and attribution model. We also intend to estimate the economic cost of climate change related health impacts on healthcare and also evaluate how much it will cost um, various climate change mitigation and ad adaptation strategies in terms of health outcomes. Thank you so much for listening. I suggest we maybe the first see all three. Yes.
and they see you as Ibn Mawla. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Collins Matiza, uh, and I'm going to be talking about detecting and attributing climate change driven shifts in terrestrial ecosystems, um, ecosystem vegetation activity. So basically, I shall just share a short bio about myself before I get into what we want to discuss today. So um, oh, sorry. So I'm coming from a um, remote sensing uh, background and um, I basically work with satellite imagery, um, drone imagery and all forms of remote sensing data. And we have been applying this to monitor um, vegetation activity, um, ecological changes that are happening um, in the in different um, ecosystems, so basically, uh, past um, my past work has been mainly around uh, forests, and I've also worked with uh, a bit of agriculture and a bit of um, uh, urban uh, uh, remote sensing as well. Uh, currently. Uh, the reason why we, we we are actually here is um, we are now working with the climate change uh, detection and attribution in vegetation. So basically, the aim is to apply the evidence that we get from um, remote sensing imagery and try and match it to uh, what is recorded by different climate models or what has been observed and try and find uh, relationships that e exist between uh, what's being experienced in terms of climate and what's being shown by the different um, changes in the environment. So my past work was on uh, the spatial temporal assessment of um, uh, spatial temporal assessment of uh, uh, carbon accumulation in um, a reforested urban area. So it was part of a bigger project that was uh, applying nature-based solutions to uh, derelict uh, pieces of land that surround cities. So the bigger project was to plant trees and we came in or part of my work was to check whether indeed um, that nature best solution of planting trees was indeed helping in uh, uh, offsetting carbon. So we wanted to check over time, since the inception of the project, what changes have occurred through the evidence of uh, remote sensing imagery. And from the study that we did, uh, we realized that indeed um, trees we're offsetting carbon and we could see an accumulation of, 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 of carbon over time. And part of it again was to test the different uh, machine learning models that are out there and uh, which ones would work best in developing that kind of tool in the end. And um, this is just part of the outcomes that we got. Uh, we, we did realize an increase in carbon over time from 2009 right up to 2022. And it's, the project is still ongoing. And um, we, we, we did notice uh, a slight uh, decline between the years 2015 and 2014, where the area experienced some uh, uh, drought events. And um, as part of this work, again, we predicted uh, the likely outcome of uh, carbon accumulation uh, over uh, the next uh, years, which was around 2040 to 2060. We did see some shifts as well um, from the predictions we did. 
now i'll just touch on what i'm currently doing i'm 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 a, I'm a postdoc that recently joined the team uh, on biodiversity uh, detection and attribution uh, i mean climate change uh, detection and attribution uh, so the aim is to actually uh, explore right um, and uh, try and use um, remote sensing as evidence of um, vegetation change. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see here. I think uh, it's too tiny. Can you please? Maybe can help you with that. anyone know how instead of how can I just duplicate the slides because here's showing that I was showing the next slide kind of like that layout you know what I mean <laughs> so like it it shows like that instead of just like duplicating that I know it can it was yeah sorry I can use my this is something you want to help me? No, 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 it's fine. I can change. So, yeah. So, sorry about that. Uh, currently, uh, the aim is to explore the impacts of climate change on terrestrial ecosystems and biodiversity. And we aim to use and leverage uh, advanced remote sensing techniques in the form of uh, satellite imagery. In this case, we are planning on using data sets like MODIS, uh, data sets like Landsat to help us uh, look at the changes in vegetation over time. And then uh, we are also trying to integrate different climate models. In this case now, that's where the different um, models that are being developed here come into place, for instance, the decadal pro prediction uh, models that they're working on here. We also intend on uh, adopting those models and integrate them together with uh, our remote sensing data and try and attribute or try and uh, link or try and find if there is a link between the vegetation change that we're experiencing and uh, what uh, the models are predicting, or we are also trying to predict again in the future the changes that might happen in terms of uh, vegetation, uh, as shown probably by the models. Uh, we aim on creating innovative tools in the end where we develop a tool that will, um, uh, that will help us in um, mitigation and monitoring aimed at supporting informed uh, decision making uh, in, 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 in our different uh, respective countries. Uh, also, we intend to combine uh, ecological insights and remote sensing climate modeling to improve our understanding of uh, climate impacts. So on to the detection and attribution uh, work that we are currently uh, starting uh, uh, we can agree that uh, indeed uh, climate is changing and uh, evidence is all over. But there's a lot that is out there and it ends up uh, creating sort of like uh, different theories, different views. And for that reason, I feel like, um, or we felt like it, it's the right time to actually come in and actually find out whether what's going on is really going on and because of the, I mean, because of the existing existence of uh, such tools like remote sensing, we could actually go back in time and make use of observed data and check whether indeed there is a, a perceived shift and if it is related to climate or if it is um, uh, human induced. So again, we 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 know uh, that theories around humans uh, pushing this climate shift 
has been uh, propounded. And our aim here is to actually say, okay, this human-induced uh, climate change, is it indeed affecting um, our vegetation? Um, and we want to see if these shifts in temperature, frequent climate-related disaster events, have a link to um, what's being experienced in our vegetation. Uh, the aims of our study is to is to utilize climate models to simulate various uh, climate scenarios and combine this with remote sensing data to monitor vegetation activity over time. This integration will provide a robust framework for understanding the relationship between climate variables and uh, vegetation changes. And from there, our intention is to use time series data uh, in the form of uh, satellite images that, that has been, co been collected over time. Uh, the largest archive I can remember is Landsat, which starts from around 1972 to date. We also have MODIS uh, data sets that can also help us. Uh, we aim to create statistical models that quantify uh, the likelihood observed shifts, shifts in vegetation activity being attributable to specific climate drivers such as temperature increases, uh, altered precipitation patterns, and extreme weather events. Uh, this uh, involves using um, statistical models uh, that exist already, for instance, uh, bison inference. Um, for the vegetation model, we want to use a state space model. Uh, and then after we have um, looked at the different uh, trends, probably, and correlations, that are existing between um, our two data sets, we then do our attribution uh, where we we will um, we will try and link right the changes uh, observed on on vegetation and uh, what has been observed on 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 the climate model. I mean on the climate data. Afterwards, we we. We then intend to, to, to predict for the future uh, using probably decadal predictions. So basically, here uh, the main thing that we're using as our main data set is um, NDVI data, which is derived from from satellite imagery, and um, that NDVI data is based on. Um, a reflection uh, that occurs between um, uh, the sub the earth surface and uh, what we basically do is uh, NDVI is normalized vegetation difference index and it is derived from subtracting the band the different bands because we know that um, vegetation is good uh, it, it 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 reflects uh, light in the in the in the observed. Uh, section of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah, so basically it's a work that is still in progress and uh, we're still building from it. Already we we have part of um, the analysis relating to NDVI. Now we need to then integrate it with the climate models. I think for the sake of time, uh, let me end here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to stand up because I want to show you. Thanks, Steve. So, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Andreas. I'm currently uh, a postdoc also at the African Climate and Development Initiative. Uh, I'm originally from Brazil, been working in South Africa for the past, I think, like five years or so. And I have a background in ecology and evolutionary biology mainly, but uh, for the past few years, working mostly on uh, climate change impacts on uh, biodiversity. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the Biodiversity Horizons Framework that uh, 
It's uh, a framework that we've been using uh, in our group uh, to predict where and when biodiversity will be exposed to climate change and how um, we are aiming to use this framework to try to uh, make predictions at more actionable timescales. And that's why uh, we are here at DSC at the moment. So you, know, you all know that climate change is having like large impacts on biodiversity. Here I listed a few of them. So uh, rain shifts, so right now, Many species are on the move in the planet. Uh, some recent estimates shows that the insects are moving roughly 18 kilometers per year towards towards higher latitudes. Uh, reptiles, six kilometers per year. Marine species, six, six kilometers per year as well. Uh, we are observing abundance shifts as well. This is the uh, yellow-billed uh, hornbill uh, from the Kalahari Desert. Uh, this is a species that is being crushed by climate change uh, in, the, in the desert. Um, is a species which the reproduction is extremely dependent on climate. So every time temperatures exceed, like daily temperatures exceed 35, 36 degrees, these guys stop breeding. And recently in the Kalahari, we have seen like more and more days every year, which temperatures exceeding these thresholds. So the reproductive rates of the hornbills of the hornbills just like dropping uh, a lot. So in I think in 2008, uh, the estimate of successful chicks per nest was like 1.1. And then the latest estimate in 2019 it was 0.4. So it's really having a hard time to reproduce. Uh, phenological shifts, so like flowering events are happening like at different uh, timings. And in most extreme case, uh, species die, obviously, when you just like have a large number of species um, that die during uh, usually uh, extreme um, climate events. Uh, so this is. Uh, a problem that have like affected by many factors and it's like for, from a conservation perspective, it's really hard to focus on like what exactly we should try to conserve with the very limited resources we have to do that. So in uh, ecology and conservation sciences, uh, research uh, <clears throat> develop a framework to first identify which are the most vulnerable species and then focus the conservation effort based on that. And to assess vulnerability, they focus on three factors, which is exposure, sensitivity and adaptive uh, capacity. So exposure uh, relates to the extent climate change is predicted to be experienced by species uh, or locality. So whether or not the species are gonna be exposed to potentially dangerous uh, climate conditions. Sensitivity is whether or not the survival or the performance of the species is dependent on climate. So some species have their performance and survival very linked to climate, coral reefs, for example, the example of the, of the hornbills. Uh, but some might not be as sensitive. And then the uh, adaptive capacity, which is like, okay, if the species is exposed, it, it's, uh, its performance or survival is uh, affected by climate change, is the species uh, capable of adapting or not? And this adaptation could be just like moving to another place or could be adapting uh, in situ in the, in the locality. And if you have like species they're going to be exposed, have high sensitivity, low adaptive capacity. You have the species at the highest uh, vulnerability uh, level. And then if you have species that are exposed, have high sensitivity, but maybe low, uh, are highly sensitive to climate change, but have uh, high adaptive capacity, maybe they're not going to be affected that much. But still, like in these like intersections here, uh, monitoring would be uh, important. So you can see that like uh, understanding when and where species will be exposed is a priority in terms of uh, biodiversity uh, conservation. Uh, and this is what ecologists have been doing for like a few decades now. So there's like probably like uh, tens of thousands of studies that aim to forecast uh, exposure of biodiversity to, to climate change. Uh, and this was like pop, uh, became quite popular when uh, species distribution models that like started to be developed and people were like using these a lot. Uh, but one of the problems with these uh, exposure forecasts is that they usually focus like on two snapshots or two time slices only. They only just like, oh, this is what we expect to happen in 2050, 2060, and this is what we expect to happen with exposure in uh, 2100. Uh, but the problem with, with uh, that approach is that then basically you don't know what's going to happen like in between these periods, right? So like you can't really... Uh, no, like, is this going to be a fast exposure, low exposure, when exactly this is going to happen? If something's predicted to happen in 2010, like when 
exactly here is uh, is predicted to happen. So this is a, a huge gap. Uh, until uh, recently, when uh, this paper uh, led by Chris Fisses, which is uh, the director of the Climate Risk Lab, what we uh, what we are working, uh, published introducing this uh, idea of this uh, biodiversity horizons framework to predict risk from biodiversity. And basically what these biodiversity horizons does is instead of like you looking into just like one or two uh, snapshots of, of the future, instead of this, you use much more um, climate data, can use like yearly projections, for example. And then because you have like not looking just a snapshot, uh, but like many times in future, then your projections would look much more like a movie over time of how things are changing instead of just uh, two photographs um, of, of, of the future and of like exposure in the future. Uh, so how exactly these, uh, this framework work? What exactly we do when we are doing this, this uh, biodiversity horizon analysis? So this is the uh, one uh, bush baby species from, from Africa. And this is the distribution of the species, right? So that's the, the grid cells that we know that the species uh, uh, occur. What we do here, we couple this distribution data with uh, historical climate data. So this can be climate data from, let's say, like 1960 to 2014, let's say. And we have this like, and we have like, imagine this is a layer where we have like yearly like projections of, uh, Really simulations of historical climates. Um, and imagine this is like just like uh, mean annual temperature, for example. Then what we can do is just like, okay, across this like whole time series that we have, we can just estimate, let's say, for example, what's the maximum temperature experienced across the range of the species here, right? And then we call that this would be the thermal limit of the species, right? So, and then we consider that like anything below. This thermal limit, the species would be able to cope with. The species is not exposed, but everything beyond this thermal limit, we consider the species exposed to uh, unprecedented temperatures, and then the species is, is at risk. Uh, and then basically, now that we have these thresholds, uh, we can use future projections to ask, okay, uh, where and when this species thermal limit is projected to be exceeded across the range. Right, so we can use them like yearly future projections too. Uh, and for each grid cell, we can calculate when these limits is gonna be exceeded. So then we know that like species exposure is not gonna happen uniformly across the range. You're gonna have like grid cells where exposure is gonna happen like much earlier. You're gonna have grid cells where exposure is gonna ha happen much later. And you're gonna have grid cells that exposure will not happen. And you can understand how this exposure accumulates over time. Right here, the percentage of the range exposed, and how uh, this is, um, and how this exposure accumulates. And then, if you do this for thousands of species, for like let's say like all the species that happen that occur in this grid cell, if you do this for them, then you can have an idea of what exactly is going on in this grid cell in terms of risks to biodiversity. Is this grid cell having lots of species exposed early in the century, later? And this temporal dynamic is very important from a from a conservation perspective. So uh, this is what has been done uh, recently by, by our group. So uh, basically trying to understand where, when, and how fast species are projected to be exposed to climate change. And then from these, you can have some metrics like magnitude of exposure, which would be like, okay, what's the percentage of species that occur in this grid cell that are gonna be exposed? And this is SSP 585, so very pessimistic, but you can see that like some regions with like more than 80% of the species predicted to be exposed. We can calculate how fast it's gonna happen. Is this like exposure gonna happen gradually over time or is this gonna happen abruptly in like a short period of time? And you can see that like many places exposure is gonna be abrupt. So it can have like some regions like between 90 and 100% of the exposure events that occur here occur in a single decade. So it's like quite fast quite abrupt, and then you can estimate the time. Okay, on average, when this is gonna happen. So you know that like regions where exposure is gonna happen like a bit earlier and regions where exposure overall is gonna happen uh, a bit later uh, in the century. We also, we did this not only with exposure, but also what we call thermal opportunities, which is uh, when 
suitable climate or suitable temperatures arise away from the range of the species. So now the species are, ranging the sh uh, are shifting the ranges. So when these opportunities for colonizations will, uh, will emerge and how long they will last? Also a question that you can answer with this framework. So we did this for marine species and here like where species are expected to be exposed. Here in blue, like where most of these thermal opportunities will emerge. And this is like the temporal dynamics. So you can see that SSP1 and SSP5, most of the changes in the, the ocean, um, uh, ocean temperatures are related to uh, changes in opportunity and only SSP5 when you have like quite uh, a huge like acceleration of all the uh, exposure over time. And then we also ask like, are these thermal opportunities like transient or persistent? How long they're gonna last? Because these temporal dynamics allow you to answer that. So we found out that actually, once one grid cell becomes suitable in the ocean, it most likely will remain suitable at least until the end of the of the century. So meaning that like species will have like opportunities to colonize cells like for for a long uh, time if these if the opportunities uh, emerge early in the in the century. Uh, this framework is also very interesting when you talk about like temperature uh, overshoot pathways where like global temperatures will go like up and due to uh, carbon dioxide removal uh, that we like would manage to bring temperatures back down. And then we can like evaluate this like overshoot this like temperature pathway. Temperatures like here, the red line go up and down and then you calculate the cumulative exposure of species. As temperature goes up, you see that there's a lag but the like exposure starts to accumulate. And after temperatures goes down, like still like even like a longer lag until the exposure uh, occurs. So then here we can see that like once you return to the same global log warming level, like in this case two degrees, the the global the exposure levels at two degrees at the beginning of the overshoot at two degrees are much lower than the exposure level levels at the end of the overshoot. So it means that like further cooling would be needed to like really ensure. Um, the exposures of the species and showing that like the exposure could last much longer than the than the overshoot and this showing the okay what's the percentage of species exposed in each grid cell during this uh this two degree overshoot also in terms of overshoot we can not only calculate uh these metrics but also like what's the on average the percentage of the range of the species that are going to be exposed during the overshoot what's the duration of the exposure who are the groups with the highest uh, proportion of species uh, exposed? So here, like reptiles and amphibians are usually the groups that have like above average uh, uh, percentage of range exposed and the duration of this uh, of this exposure. So this idea of having like this temporal dynamic like give us like a lot of new information instead of just looking at a few snapshots of of the future, but. Uh, if you look at these projections, like if you look at this one, for example, you can see that like in terms of time, right? You still like projecting things to happen like quite far into the future, right? And uh, if if we look at the horizon of biodiversity, basically what we are observing is gonna happen like here, like quite still like at the end of the, of the horizon. And if you go to a, uh, Park manager, for example, and say like, oh, like we have these data here, we have these projections, we predict that like in 2070, 50% of the species in the park are going to be exposed to climate change, like the park manager is going to say like 2070, like that we're struggling to have like a plan for the next 10 years, you know, so uh, even though this is like very um, useful, we're still looking like far into the future. So uh, our question now would be like, can we use the biodiversity horizons to be to make predictions at more actionable timescales? Can instead of like looking at these like mountains here, looking at the ones that are like closer to us and detect exposure maybe in a shorter time scale? And that's where uh, dedicated predictions maybe can help us. And that's uh, the reason we're here to learn more about these predictions and to understand how we can uh use our framework or adapt our framework to the decade of predictions understand what type of information they can provide what are the strengths what are the the caveats and uh, yeah and all the stuff so uh if we manage to make this work 
uh, we're going to have not only forecasts and more actionable time scales because we can go to policymakers and say, like, this is what we expect to happen in one year. This is what we expect to happen, like, in one to five years, five to ten. Uh, we can look at more seasonal exposure. Maybe right now we're just looking at, like, yearly, like, average when these will be exceeded. Now with the Cato, maybe we can look, also, okay, maybe, like, the exposure is really going to happen, like, on summer, right? But, like, if you just look at the yearly average, you can't really detect this. Uh, this can guide monitoring efforts, for example, right? If we have this information out there, which is like conservation uh, practitioners to just like say, okay, like we're expecting exposure of these species in this locality, which of those can we monitor, right? Or like which of those are we already monitoring so we can have an idea like, is this exposure affecting biodiversity or not? And if it is, okay, we know that like our predictions and our model is working and if it does not work, then we can use this information to maybe tune our model because right now we treat all species as if they would respond the same. And we know that that's not the, that's not the case, but since we're working with thousands of species, it's hard to do like species specific uh, tuning at the moment. And this information will help to improve our biodiversity forecast if we can set these monitoring efforts and can really understand what's going on or not. Uh, another idea that we think could be useful is creating a demand for monitoring from community science. We know that community science plays an important role like in providing data for ecologies. We have these apps like iNaturalist, uh, Seek, that just like you can take pictures while when you're like hiking or something and just like upload these to a server and this data can be used, uh, can be downloaded. Uh, so maybe we can have like uh, demand for monitoring and like a community working, not just in taking photos of like of cute animals or plants, but also like reporting events that could be linked to like climate change, like species die-offs, for example, would be, yeah, a bit creepy maybe, but would be very useful information, right? And another strength is that like, we can have yearly updates on that, right? So we can like in a very short time know like are our predictions getting, are we getting our predictions right or wrong and why and like try to improve these, uh, these forecasts. And yeah, so that's why we're here. And yeah, before I finish, just quickly acknowledge all the people that are working this uh, project with us. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Lauren. Speakers and 